Hi guys, it is another hot, brutal day here in the oven of the collapse of global industrial civilization here in uh, the oven of Garfield, Texas on this steamy <coughs> Saturday morning, May 26, 2018. So before I get out there and enjoying the, the herd of lemmings going over the cliff, uh, I want to bring you today's Collapse Chronicle from uh, one of my heroes who we have not heard that much about, and this is uh, Richard Heinberg. He used to be all over the Doomosphere. He seems to have taken a bit of a back seat uh, in the past few years. Hopefully, uh, my producer, Laurel Finch, can uh, hopefully Laurel can uh, convince Richard Heinberg to uh, speak to us here on uh, Collapse Chronicles about what he's up to. But while we're waiting for that response from Richard, I'm going to check in. He is still uh, writing for his excellent blog at the Post Carbon Institute. And can't remember which alert reader sent me uh, his latest essay uh, from his blog uh, at the Post Carbon Institute titled Systems Thinking, Critical Thinking, and Personal Resilience. And I'm going to put the link on this long involved article and uh, encourage you to shut me up and read it yourself. But if you just want your old uh, collapsitarian to sit here and read it for you, I will start that. My guess is that my, I might suffer my own collapse of global industrial civilization and my battery might give out. Uh, that evil twin of mine over there on that other channel has co-opted my battery. So I don't know what he left me uh, for battery juice. So anyway, let me get into it. So if the if, if this just shuts down in the middle, I apologize, but you'll just have to go on the link yourself. I'm not going to have time to read the whole thing, but let's let's read about 20 minutes into this story. If my battery will give me 20 minutes, take it away, Richard Heinberg. Tell us about systems thinking, critical thinking, and personal resilience. <clears throat> As a writer focused on the global sustainability crisis, I am often asked how to deal with the stress of knowing, knowing, that is, that we humans have severely overshot Earth's long-term carrying capacity making a collapse of both civilization and Earth's ecological systems likely, knowing that we are depleting Earth's resources, including fossil fuels and minerals, and clogging its waste sinks like the atmosphere's and oceans' ability to absorb CO2, knowing that the decades of rapid economic growth that characterize the late 20th and early 21st centuries are ending and that further massive interventions by central banks and governments cannot do more than buy us a little bit more time of relative stability knowing that technology, even renewable energy technology, will not save our fundamentally unsustainable way of life. In the years I've spent investigating these predicaments, I've been fortunate to meet experts who have delved deeply into specific issues, which is what I'm trying to do with my own interview series, if we can find some more people who will agree to be interviewed. Experts on the biodiversity crisis, the population crisis, the climate crisis, the resource depletion crisis, the debt crisis, the plastic waste crisis, and on and on and on. 
in my admittedly partial judgment, some of the smartest people I have met happen also to be among the more pessimistic. Do you think so? <clears throat> in discussing climate change and all our other eco-social predicaments, how does one distinguish accurate information from statements intended to either elicit false hope, false hope, or needless capitulation to immediate and utter doom. And in cases where pessimistic outlooks do seem securely rooted in evidence, how does one psychologically come to terms with the information? So he breaks this down into systems thinking, critical thinking, and personal resilience, starting uh, with systems thinking. First, if you want to have an accurate picture of the world, it is vital to pay attention to the connection between things. That means thinking in systems. Evidence of failure to think in systems is all around us, and there is no better example than the field of economics which treats the environment as simply a pile of resources to be plundered rather than as the living and necessary context in which the economy is grounded. No healthy ecosystem, no economy. This one single crucial failure of economic theory has made it far more difficult for most people, and especially business people and policymakers, to understand our sustainability dilemma or do much about it. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, the field in which systems thinking is most highly developed in ecology the study of the relationships between organisms and their environments. Since it, ecology, is a study of relationships rather than things in isolation, ecology is inherently systems oriented. Systems thinking has a prehistory in indigenous thought. Uh, or all are related is a common phrase uh, in, in the Lakota language, but as a formal scientific pursuit, it emerged only during the latter part of the 20th century. Previously, Western scientists often assumed that they could understand systems just by analyzing their parts. However, it gradually became clear in particular fields, in particular fields from medicine to wildlife management to business management, that this often led to unintended consequences. Um, in, in, anyway, guys, I, I, I need this is a long involved story, and I want to touch on several things he's talking about, so I'm going to skip ahead uh, uh, through some of this. Uh, in order to address systemic problems, we need to understand what systems are and how to intervene in them most effectively. So all systems, all systems have boundaries, boundaries which are semi-permeable separation between the inside and outside of systems, inputs of energy, information, and materials, outputs, including work of various kinds, flows to and from the environment, stocks, 
of, of useful nutrients, resources, and other materials, and feedbacks, feedbacks, of which there are two basic kinds, balancing or negative feedbacks, like a thermostat, and self-reinforcing or positive <coughs> feedbacks, which is the proverbial vicious cycle. Systems need balancing feedback loops to remain stable and can be destabilized or even destroyed by self-reinforcing positive feedback loops. This is a big, tr even I have trouble with this guy's overstating, oversimplifying in this. It is the positive feedback loops that are the bad guys and the negative feedback loops that are the good guys. Uh, that is way oversimplifying it, but I know even I have a problem with this. Uh, moving ahead, okay. The global climate is an example of a system. The global climate is a system, and climate change is therefore a systemic problem. Some non-systems thinkers have proposed solving climate change by putting chemicals into the Earth's atmosphere to manage solar radiation. Because this solution only addresses part of the systemic problem, it is likely to have many unintended consequences. Systems thinking would suggest very different approaches, such as reducing fossil fuel consumption while capturing and storing atmospheric carbon in replanted forest and regenerated topsoils. Uh, and then he has some charts. Okay. Uh, in some cases, a systemic approach to addressing climate change can also have dramatic side benefits. Regenerative agriculture would not just sequester more carbon in the soil, it would also make our food system more sustainable while preserving biodiversity. Interventions based in systems thinking often tend to solve many problems at once. Donella Meadows, who is one of the great systems thinkers of the past few decades, left us a brilliant essay titled Leverage Points, Places to Intervene in a System. Uh, I might have to come back to this essay in a future rant. Uh, so, Danella Meadows was one of the authors of The Limits to Growth. I'm pretty sure she was the wife of Dennis Meadows. Anyway, moving uh, along, uh, and then he moves into The Limits of Growth. Um, talking about uh, in 1972 the publishing of the cornerstone of systems literature, the limits to growth. If there's anybody uh, on this channel who has not read both the original limits to growth and the updates, I think there's been two updates to the limits of growth. Uh, you need to stop everything else you're doing in your life and read all of the limits to growth. Uh, anyway, uh, systems thinking often tends to lead to a more pessimistic view of our ecological crisis than thinking that focuses on one thing at a time because it reveals the shortcomings of widely touted techno-fixes. There you go. Uh, but if there are 
truly and useful strategies to be found, systems thinking will reveal them. So uh, again, guys, I, I'm skipping over a lot of this. Uh, so you need to go back and read this entire thing. So now let's move on to critical thinking. Critical thinking, you uh, know, I'm often saying discernment and critical thinking are the two biggest shortages here in the Dumasphere and anywhere else on the planet is the abandonment of discernment and critical thinking. So what does Richard have to say about critical thinking? Human thought is rooted partly in words, partly in emotions, and partly in the body states that may accompany or give rise to emotions. Another way of saying this is that our thought processes are partly conscious, but mostly unconscious. In our conscious lives, we are immersed in a soup of language which often simply expresses judgments, intuitions, and observations that emerge from unconscious thought. But thought that is expressed in language has great potential. Using language, including mathematics, we can assess the validity of statements about the world, then build upon proven statements until we ultimately achieve comprehensive scientific understanding as the capacity to manipulate reality in new ways. Um, of course, language can be powerful in another way. Some of us use language to persuade, confuse, or mislead others so as to gain social or economic power appeals to unconscious prejudices, including peer groupthink, are frequently employed to sway the masses. The best protection against being the subject of verbal manipulation is the ability to use language to distinguish logic from illogic, truth from untruth. Critical thinking helps us separate information from propaganda. It can help us think more clearly and productively. One way to approach critical thinking is through the study of logic, including formal logic, which builds conclusions almost mathematically, informal logic, which also considers content, context, and delivery, and even fuzzy logic. Uh, most of our daily thinking consists of informal and fuzzy logic, and this is why, you know, when I was in journalism school, at least where I was in college, uh, that journalism students, and this is probably true surely in most journalism schools, that it was mandatory that we took courses in logic that anybody going out there to report on uh, reality needs to understand how to sharpen their processes of discernment and critical thinking and the study of logic is a major part of this. Uh, and so he breaks all this all down and he recommends this, uh, this book, Lean Logic, his favorite book on the subject, Lean Logic by David Fleming. And um, I'm just going to share this one part. While learning the rules of formal logic can help in honing one's critical thinking, it is just as useful, I would say critical, to familiar side, familiarize your, yourself with logical fallacies, which is a major, major part of any 
uh, course in logic is how to recognize logical fallacies <clears throat> which include circular reasoning, name calling, hasty generalization, stereotyping, the either or fallacy, and appeal to the bandwagon. These days that is a fair description of much of the content on social media, especially here on YouTube. Learn to spot these logical fallacies in political discourse, discourse but better yet, learn to catch yourself using them. That's the hardest part. Uh, as politics, I'm, I'm moving ahead to the end of that system, as politics becomes more tribal, critical thinking skills become ever more important if you want to understand what is really going on and prevent yourself from becoming collateral damage in the war of words. And uh, then the last section is personal resilience. Uh, let's return to the premise of this essay. Suppose you have applied systems thinking and critical thinking to the information available to you about the status of the global ecosystem and have come to the conclusion that we are in deep shit. You want to be effective at helping minimize risk and damage to ecosystems, humanity, yourself, and those close to you. To achieve this, one of the first things you will need to do is learn to maintain and use your newfound knowledge without becoming paralyzed or psychically injured by it. Knowledge of impending global crisis can cause what has been called pre-traumatic stress disorder. As with other disorders, success in coping or recovery can be enhanced through developing personal or psychological resilience. Fortunately, psychological resilience is increasingly important subject of research uh, into why some people bounce back from adversity relatively easy while others seem to fall apart. The reason doesn't seem to have much to do with being more of an optimist than a pessimist. Resilient research has shown that resilient people realistically assess risks and threats. Studies suggest that in some ways pessimists can have the advantage. What seems to distinguish resilient people is their use of successful coping techniques to balance negative emotions with positive ones and maintain an underlying sense of competence and assurance. And then he gives some uh, tips on how to do that. Uh, and he touches on dealing with grief. Uh, Your, further, your personal resilience will be greatly enhanced as you work with others who are also blessed or burdened with knowledge of our collective overshoot predicaments. And this is talking about, uh, you know, getting into groups uh, with other people. It is so important that we have uh, forums to be able to air our grief and offer advice uh, on how we are supposed to handle this. And this is what this channel, Collapse Chronicles, is all about. 
uh, that we're going to want. Again, I've skipped over a lot of this. And let's get to the bottom line. Even if we do all we can, there is no guarantee that problems will be solved, extinctions, extinctions prevented, collapsed or stalled, but paralysis only guarantees the very worst outcome, outcome. In the words of the Bhagavad Gita, quote, the wise should work without attachment to results for the welfare of the world, close quote. Act from love with the best understanding you have and always seek to improve your understanding it is all that any of us can do. And I would like to thank Brother Richard Heinberg for his latest excellent essay uh, and hope that we can uh, pin Richard down for an hour-long uh, interview sometime this year to uh, offer us more tips in critical thinking and personal resilience in the face of the coming and ongoing collapse. But with that, I'm going to wrap up today's Collapse Chronicle essay of the day, and I guess I'm going to head out uh, into, the, uh, into the madness for more evidence. Little dog, you look like you're already collapsed. Are you collapsed in front of the air conditioner? Bye guys.